Capital Finance Solutions, Aware Senior Care, and ESI. Thank you very much to them for making this possible. Thank you to all of you for joining us. We've had some very good uh, conversations so far, and I know today is uh, going to follow along that same line. We're talking about dementia, depression, and delirium with Melanie, and I know that it's going to be a very interesting conversation. So I don't want to keep us from it because I'm sure it's going to be a long talk. So Melanie, jump right in. Well, thanks, Lisa, and I'm um, I'm thankful to everybody for being here. Um, I know it's it's um, hard to do something at a certain time these days. Everything seems, you know, just so when it happens. So being here at noon and being here until one is is a real commitment. So um, I'm thank you. I thank you for doing that. I'm going to ask you if you look down at the bottom. There's kind of a little rectangular bubble kind of thing. And, and that will help you use the chat. So I'm going to ask if everybody will just put in the chat um, who they're here for, if it's for a parent or if it's for a spouse, or you can say, I don't want to say, or if it's for my clients, but just kind of put in that chat um, who you, why you came today, or if you're worried about yourself, or um, if other people are worried about you, just kind of drop in that chat um, who you are here kind of seeking information about. So moms seem to be a thing, oh, a bunch of moms, moms and a brother and a father and husband, and so um, clients, why? So those are the kinds of people I would I would expect you to be here for, parents and, and spouses, and some of you have both family and it's your job. So thanks to everybody for being here. It's nice to, to see that. Um, people are here for different reasons. And I think that helps us really have really honest conversations about how these kinds of things specifically we build a team around because these are the kinds of issues that everybody's perspective really makes a difference. The family's perspectives, perspectives of people who are in the, the business, all of those things, um, all those people's perspectives make a difference. I'm also going to ask um, if you can, I know some of you are in situations where it's not comfortable or appropriate to, um, to turn your cameras on, but if you can turn your camera on, um, it's the little thing, it looks like an old fashioned movie camera and it's down also on that taskbar and it's probably got a red line through it. And if you click it, I'll be able to see you and I'll know who I'm, that I'm talking to real people and not people who are are pretending to be cats or people who are, um, there was a great video about that. Lisa's laughing. She's seen that video about the attorney who um, says, I am not a cat, um, who looks like a cat and has a filter on. So people are still joining us, but that's what we're kind of gonna be talking about today are the issues of delirium, depression and dementia. So I wanted to be able to see the people that I can. I wanted you to be able to either unmute and ask a question or to drop it in the chat. Either one of those are fine with me. So I'm gonna share my screen and let's go ahead and get started talking about one of, um, this, is, this is really how I got involved in this whole process of dementia. Um, I'm a nurse and I went through nursing school at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I, I was excited to be a nurse. I thought I was gonna work with babies and women having babies. And, and I thought that was where I was gonna, but when I was in nursing school, you had to spend some time doing general nursing like on a med search floor before you could specialize. So I started out in orthopedics because having been an athlete myself and having um, been around athletes all my life and kind of understanding the way bones and muscles and stuff work, I thought that would be a really great way um, to start my nursing practice. And what I found was it was a great work way to start my nursing practice, but not the way I expected. Because what I became fascinated by 
were how people's brains worked and how their brains didn't work depending on what we did and what we didn't do to them. So I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second while I'm kind of telling this story. Um, so I would talk to families, I worked evenings, so I would get to see families often. I would talk to families and they would say, um, you know, I, we talk about mom and mom is 87 years old and mom is in with a broken hip and mom is pulling bugs out of the, 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 the air and mom is screaming and trying to get out of the bed with her broken hip and mom is just not doing well. Um, and I would talk to family and they would say, well, mom lives by herself and she does great. And I'm like going, one of us are wrong here. <laughs> you know, one of us, one of us is wrong because the woman who's lying in that bed, I cannot in good faith send her off home to live by herself because she is seeing bugs and she's trying to get up and walk on her broken hip. And this doesn't make sense. And that really became, became my fascination with brains and how brains work and they don't work and what kind of things help them work and what kind of things really interfere with them working. So I am gonna go back and share my screen now. And we're gonna talk about dementia, de depression and dementia, delirium and depression. We're actually gonna start with delirium and then talk about depression and then talk about dementia. And we're gonna talk about what's the same and what's different. So we're gonna start by thinking about what are the warning signs? How do I know that I need to be worried? I needed to be concerned because if you're not worried, you don't get more information. So how do I know to be concerned? Well, the important thing, and this is for all of us is, and this is why the partnership makes so much sense, is you don't know when something is different when you don't know what's normal for this person. When you don't know what's normal, you don't know when it's different. So if you meet me and I we are going on a trip together and I need my GPS to get out of the parking lot, if you don't know that that's absolutely normal for me, that I've got no sense of direction, I've never had a sense of direction. If you don't know that's normal for me, you might be kind of worried that you're going on a trip with someone who can't get out of the parking lot. But if you know that's normal for me, you're not worried about it. So know what's normal for this person and also know, know what's normal for people as they get older because change is part of the aging process. And we're gonna talk just a tiny bit about that. So I'm also going to encourage you to have a really low threshold for suspicion, but not for labeling. So I want you to be really aware of this gets my attention. I'm going to pay attention to this. This is different. I'm going to pay attention to it, but not to give it a label because you don't know what it might be. But notice when something is different different. We're going to talk about what some of those differences might be in just a couple of minutes, but notice when something is different to go, I need more information, not she's sick or he's got dementia or this or this, but to go, this is my clue that I need to go get more information. I need to get this checked out because when you, when you ask for help, when you reach out to healthcare providers, you reach out to families, you reach out to people for information, um, you wanna get back what you, what you ask for. And words are powerful. So when I was in, um, my, my mom um, never has done anything like this before, hasn't done it since, but my mom took me and my brother and some other family on a trip. And we went to, well, I'm not going to say exactly, but we went to Paris. And 
I spoke French and I took French for three years in high school, took French for three semesters in college. I had a little bit of French. So when I went up to order our sandwiches, I ordered our sandwiches in French. And I think I'm really something special. I know what I'm talking about. And I asked for poisson. And what I meant was poulet. Now poisson is fish and poulet is chicken. So what I asked for was fish salad. And what I wanted was chicken salad. Now I don't like tuna fish salad. And so I was really disappointed, but I got what I asked for, but I didn't ask for what I wanted. So with this whole process, think about what you ask for. Because if you ask for help in certain ways, you're going to get certain kinds of responses. If I ask for help with some symptoms, but not some context, I might get a knee jerk kind of quick reaction that doesn't really help the person living with dementia and doesn't really help the person who's helping and doesn't help me either. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go through and hopefully get you to the point where you're not asking for fish when you want chicken. So these warning signs we're talking about, we're talking about things like changes. And I'm gonna stop sharing right now. And I'm gonna ask you to drop into the chat or I'm gonna ask you to unmute and call out some of the changes that you might be worried about that you might notice in the person living with dementia. That might be something that might indicate Something is not right with this person. Then we're going to go back and look at my list. So just put in the chat some things you might notice or unmute and, and say out some of those things you might notice. So Lisa put in there withdrawal from social activity. So that person who is usually always in the middle of everything, at every activity, at every event, calling family, reaching out from home, that person who's usually in the middle of everything pulls back a little bit. That's gonna get my attention. Um, somebody else put in there sleeping more in ways that aren't right for them. So maybe it's taking more naps during the day. Maybe for somebody else, it's sleeping really late in the morning if they've always been an early riser or going going back to their room to go to bed. And it's it's really early in the evening. It's not when they would typically do it. Thinking about things like maybe it's not too much sleeping. Maybe it's actually not enough sleeping. So the person who can't settle and, and, and can't go to sleep at night is up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down, getting up really, really early in the morning or not being able to settle at night. So changes in sleeping. Um, I saw someone else put in there, um, talking to somebody who's not there. So having some hallucinations or some misinterpretation of something that's going on. So talking to someone who's not there and really having a conversation with someone who isn't there. And that's a new thing. That's not something that has been going on for a while. That's something that's new and different. We want to pay attention to that. Um, somebody put in there missing appointments, um, showing up for church on the wrong day. Now I am having horrible problems with my calendar right now. I am just really struggling with my calendar because I'm used to scheduling a day to do something. So I'm going to Texas. I'm going to be there Thursday and Friday. And now I'm not scheduling my time in days. I'm scheduling my time and hours and things are overlapping and running together. This one's running long and that one's starting short. And so, so but I've always kind of been a little bit that way. Someone who's always been good at keeping up with appointments, always been on time for things, um, always been able to be at the right place at the right time. And that's not working so much. Um, Patty said, putting stuff in a new place. So after 25 years, the keys have always gone here. So when you look for the keys, we know the keys are here. And now after 25 years, the keys aren't where they're supposed to be and they've always been there and now we're putting them somewhere safe where nobody can find them. Chat thing. those safe places where nobody can find them 
And and Leslie's computer unmuted. Did you want to add something or was that an accident, Leslie? Yes, no, just that um, they forget to take their medications. Okay, so that's a really important one. So they're not yes. taking their medication and they've, they've always been really good at that. And now they're not taking their medication the same way, asking questions over and over and over. And when you ask them something that's pretty simple, you get this really, I have no clue kind of response. Um, Anna put in there, um, not looking like they used to look. So someone who's always been very well groomed is now looking a little slovenly or, or someone who's um, always been very um, well put together and was having clown cheeks right here and bright red lipstick. So that's something to worry about. Another um, bedtime sleeping kind of thing and having people who aren't really there or that you can't see anyway. Um, angry outbursts, so personality changes. Somebody who's always been easy going, never created a lot of trouble. Now things are, you, you know you're not supposed, now why did you do that, you huzzy, you huzzy tramp? Um, and of course, never has the huzzy tramp be worried about those kinds of things that might be a challenge. Um, I also noticed that Catherine is unmuted. Um, Catherine, did you, did you have something you wanted to add? So Catherine, I'm wondering if you want, you, you unmuted, did you have something to add or was that an accident? All right. So Catherine, if, if you want to add something in, just, just speak up. Maybe something's not working for Catherine. All right. Well, we'll just, we'll just trust that if Catherine wants to reach out or, or needs to reach out at, at some point that, that she will and we'll be here for her. So let's go back and check my list and see what I came up with. I came up with change in routine and we got that. Change in personality, we got that. Change in language and we sort of got around that with some of those outbursts kind of things. Making mistakes, we sort of got a little bit towards that with the medications and, and, and um, some of those other kinds of things. Um, changes in eating and sleeping and moving and ability to take care of stuff. We, we kind of, of, of put some stuff in about that. Not looking the same, not acting the same. So give yourselves a hand. Go ahead and put up your, um, your, your celebration. You've got something down there where you can um, put up clapping hands or thumbs up or the horn with the celebration kind of thing. Put up something, celebrate. Because y'all got all my warning signs. So now we know that something is different. Something is different what could it be? And we're really going to talk about four things that might be. It might be normal aging. It might be delirium. It might be depression. It might be a dementia. So those are the four things we're going to talk about. Now, we're not going to spend much time on this normal aging piece, except to say that we, if we don't know what's normal, we don't know what's wrong. But this normal aging piece, there, um, I have some um, videos on the Dementia Alliance um, Facebook, um, YouTube page that I go into some of these changes. One of the early COVID videos that I did um, actually has some information about how does aging change people, but just generally uh, being a little bit more forgetful, meaning it takes more time to get new stuff in. So we don't tend to store new stuff quite as much taking a little bit more time to learn new stuff. So if you have a new device to use, you're probably gonna go to the 13 year old grandchild and not the 83 year old grandmother to figure out how to use the Roku. It takes longer to get information that's been stored to get it out there, but you actually are smarter the older you get. You may not be faster, but you're actually smarter when it comes to things like vocabulary, when it comes to things like 
putting complicated things together and coming up with a good plan. That's normal aging, but everybody's going to change in ways that are unique. So none of these things stop. None of these things shut up and stop. So if I've always been forgetful, I'm going to be more forgetful. I never worry about names. Um, so if I have trouble, um, not, not me as a clinician, me as a nurse, I don't worry about people forgetting names. So if that's what worrying you, let go of it, you're fine. Um, unless that person has been a politician or unless that person was a clergy person. So um, someone who served in a faith perspective because they tend to be, real, or a teacher. Teachers tend to be really good with names. So unless I was one of those people, I don't really worry about names that much. People will take longer to learn new stuff, trouble with names know the word, but not be able to get it out. But it doesn't mean they can't do these things. It means people are just a little bit more different. So I had a lady who I was seeing for home health. And thanks Lisa for dropping that in the, um, the chat. I appreciate you putting that one in there. Um, I had a lady I was seeing for home health and she walked a mile every morning and a mile every evening. And she was 99 years old. So she was pretty tough. So I went into interview her the first time and I said, so how is your, 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 um, your vision? How is your hearing? You know, all those things I asked. I'm a nurse, so how are your bowels? All those things I asked. I finally said, how are your, your memory? And she looked at me and she said, well, Ms. Bunn, I have a terrible problem with my memory. And so I went, ding, ding, ding. She remembered my name. Most people don't remember my name. I need more information. So I said, tell me about this terrible problem you have with your memory. She said, well, I can watch 60 minutes on Sunday night and wake up on Monday morning and not remember, but two of the three programs it showed until I look it up in my, and I'm going, I can watch 60 minutes on Sunday night, wake up on Monday morning, not remember watching 60 minutes, much less what any of those programs were about. She had a beautiful memory. It wasn't as good as it was when she was 59 or 19, but still very, very good. So you've got to kind of know what's normal for one person until you can know what's not normal for that person. So if you don't know where they started, you don't know where they are. So we're gonna move in now and start talking about, we think it's more than normal aging. We think it's more than just a little bit more or a little bit less. And it's more than just a little bit of practice or a little bit of support. This is something different. Then we move into which of those three things could it be? So the first one we're gonna talk about is delirium. So delirium is kind of also called acute confusion. And this is what was happening to my lady in the hospital or, or the gentleman, the older gentleman I worked with in the hospital when they were doing fine at home and they came into the hospital and all of a sudden things aren't working anymore. So drop into the chat or unmute or call out. What are some of the things that you think might be happening to that person that are changing the way their brain work between living alone at home and being in the hospital with a broken hip? What are some of the things that might be changing that might be creating differences in the way that person's brain works. So drop it in the chat or unmute and say some things out. Pain medications. Pain medication. Um, and we know, I mean, this is one of those and somebody else put pain medication. Um, is pain bad for your brain? Yeah, I would think so. <laughs> pain is really bad for your brain. Pain is really bad for your brain but pain medications can make your brain not work the way it used to, especially if you've got some early dementia. My back hurts. I tank some pain medicine. That's okay. But I walk back to the bathroom and I come back and I go, my back hurts. And I take some more pain medicine and I walk. And so mistaking pain medication, especially pain medication, even taken perfectly exactly the way it's 
supposed to be done for pain can create challenges. I am not saying don't manage pain. We have got to manage pain. Um, but we want to be thoughtful, intentional, pay attention to it. Um, somebody put in their noise levels. So think, and, and that kind of goes along with the next thing is, is being out of your routine. So different things, things that are loud and scary and hard to understand, different people coming in and out, lots going on um, in the hospital. They're beeping, beeping, beeping all night long, being out of your familiar routine, out of your familiar environment. Because when they took my lady to the hospital, they took her to the hospital. When they found her at the end of her, her, um, her driveway on the ground, they took her to the hospital what did they not take with her that she might really need? Hello. Hmm? Her glasses. Her glasses. Hearing um, aids. Her hearing aids. Her pocketbook. Her calendar. All of those things that help her. So they took her to the hospital, but they didn't take her stuff with her. And that can create some real problems, being out of that routine, not having what you need and being in, in, in a difficult situation. Somebody put in there sadness or depression because, so grief actually, of, of not being able to do things the way she used to be able to do. Um, lights coming on and off, not being able to turn the lights on, the lights not being bright enough, things not making sense. Because if I have, if I slept with my sister, and I did until I went to college, but if I slept instead, if I slept with my sister in the same bed until I got married, and then I slept with my husband in the same bed until I wind up in the hospital, being in that bed by myself is gonna be really confusing. Time gets confusing, can't get sleep. So all of these things, this is a great list. All of these things can lead to this situation of delirium. Now here's the good news about delirium. Delirium is fixable. When we fix what's wrong, people's brains can go back to how they used to work and they used to function. So important to notice about delirium, these are not people who are slowly, slowly, slowly across months and years changing. Delirium is a sudden change. You saw mom on Friday, you see mom on Monday, mom is different. Sudden changes fluctuations where sometimes the person is awake and and able to do things and then again they're asking things that don't make any sense not being able to pay attention or being being really hyper focused on something um not being really hard to wake up or or really not able to understand the world so i'll ask people something like um what would happen if i threw a pebble in the ocean and they say it floats. You know, not having that ability to put things together in their brain. Delirium is a medical emergency because, you know, what I said a few minutes ago, if we treat it, the brain can get back to where it used to be. The faster we get it managed, the better chance we've got of getting that brain back into that normal state for it. So getting that treatment fast makes a difference. But if someone gets delirium, it means even when we fix it, their brain is still a little vulnerable. Their brain is still a little risk because people who have delirium are at higher risk for later on developing dementia or maybe having a little bit of dementia underneath that we, we aren't really completely aware of yet. So causes of delirium, the things that make a difference. Y'all are so smart. Y'all got a lot of these. You got um, it, medications. There are also some things, anything that's out of whack. So a new thing like an infection or a new thing like it's July in North Carolina and the person gets dehydrated or um, new things like um, a bad cold. I've got a bad cold and I'm all stuffed up like this and I can't breathe. So I'm not sleeping good at night. Anything, anything that's new like that can cause delirium. Something that I've had for a while, but it's getting off management. Maybe it, the condition is getting worse 
or maybe I'm getting a little iffy on the management, something like diabetes or high blood pressure can cause this kind of confusion if it's not being managed well. And, and medications, even good medications given for good reasons, even medications sometimes that the person has taken before or has been taking a while can cause delirium. Also, emotions. So chronic grief or chronic sadness or chronic anxiety, it can interfere with the way the brain works and create this environment where the brain can't function. And then environmental kinds of things. And y'all identified a lot of those, including the routine being off. So we usually do things this way and now it's all out of kilter and it's not working for that person. And then changes in the physical environment can also be a big cause of that. So I'm gonna stop sharing right now. Um, urinary tract infection, someone else put in there. Um, another one can be um, constipation or impaction. So not having a bowel movement can cause that. Any kind of infection can cause that unmanaged pain can cause that, sleep deprivation can cause that, um, fluid and electrolyte imbalances. So that means something like um, getting dehydrated or someone who takes a medicine that depletes their potassium and they're not replacing the potassium, that can cause it as well. Um, it can happen because of a fall. So maybe the person falls and they hit their head and it can be a, a bleed in the brain or maybe they fall and they lie there long enough and they don't eat and that's enough to do it. Or maybe they fall and they're hurting so bad they become really delirious or maybe it's the reason they fell. Maybe they fell because they had a stroke and so something else is going on underlying um, in their brain. So anything that affects your body can also impact your brain. So are, do you have any questions specifically about this sudden onset, this delirium? You know, it happens quickly. If we fix what's causing it, people can get better. Is that kind of making kind of clear? You can, you can um, put in a reaction. You can put in a thumbs up if you kind of, if it's making sense what I've been talking. So I see a thumbs up. So I, and I'm not hearing a lot of questions. A couple of thumbs are going up. Okay. So if you have a question later on, we can come back to this, but we're going to go on and move into the next one. With, if I go the right way, which is depression. Now, depression is complicated. Um, everything's complicated in my world. Every condition I work with is complicated, but depression especially is complicated because if you don't pay really close attention, it can look like delirium or it can look like dementia. It can look like either one of those. So we have to really pay attention to the losses and the changes that are going on in the person's life. So if I watch TV and I watch the commercials about depression, so if I watch TV and I watch the commercials about depression, I have some bad ideas about depression because I start to believe that people who have depression are gray or blue. So they're cartoon characters and they're looking longingly out the window and they're looking sad and withdrawn and they're, they're kind of watching life go by. Um, and, and that really gray and blue people aren't depressed. People who are depressed aren't gray or blue. Um, so that's really not accurate. There are really two ways that people can look when they've got depression. And one way that people can look, meaning how they act, how they respond. I'm using look in a pretty broad term, how they seem, how they act, um, is, is sad and withdrawn and not have any interest and, and not having any energy. So if I talk with someone um, and I say, um, oh, I'm so excited um, 
you know, COVID, you know, people are getting vaccinated and, and um, things are opening up a little bit and soon your grandchildren will be able to see you. Come and visit, your grandchildren will be able to come and visit. And that person says, well, you know, it's not that, it, it's, it, if they wanna come, they can come, but I, um, you know, I've got, I've, I've got, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a big deal. And if that has been someone who's always loved and cherished their grandchildren, do I worry about that person? Yes, I worry about that person. So I look for things like somebody not looking forward to something they would have typically looked forward to or somebody who isn't interested in things that they used to be interested in. So that loss of joy, that loss of interest, that loss of energy gets my attention and tunes me into this may be more than sadness. This may be more than grief. A lot of us are grieving a lot of things during these COVID times. You know, I grieve that um, I, I can't be with family members as much as I would like to. I grieve that there were, were time, you know, we can't be close and hug and, and love on each other. Like I grieve that, but I'm looking forward to when that can happen again. That's grief. Depression is, well, you know, it's all right. It's what we've got now. We just, we just got to go through it. That's the difference kind of a little bit between grief and depression. But I really said there were two types of depression. The other type of depression you don't see on those commercials. They don't show you this type on the commercials. They don't, because this is the type of depression that is, I don't want your help. I don't need your help. You can just get on out of here with your get on self. Now, write in the chat real quick. What would you call me if I said something like that? Would y'all call me depressed or something else? Drop in the chat real quick. What would you call that person who says, I don't need your help. I don't want your help. You, you, you're, you're worthless. Just get out of here and go on about your own business. If I need something, I'll let somebody know because I'm guessing the sounds reasonable comment was not about that. I'm, I'm thinking Lee responded sounds reasonable to uh, my, my previous question, which is, are you getting delirium? So um, I see difficult, having a bad year, crabby. Yeah, Lee's agreeing with me. Um, what would you call that person behind their back? You might call them, just drop some other words in there. What are some of those other words you might say about that person? Crabby is a good one. Grumpy, uh, unreasonable. Um, I, I had a lady um, and it, Crampy, grumpy, out of sorts. I had, I was doing a program and I asked a similar question, and and this woman blurted out something, and I and as soon as she said it, she went like this, and I knew that she didn't mean to say it because I asked, "What would you call that person who says get out of here with your get on self?" And she said, "Mother in law." <laughs> um, and she didn't mean to say it, but it was kind of true. So we call those people irritable or angry, aggressive. We might use profanities for those people, bitter. Um, we don't always say depressed because we think about depressed as being sad. But the truth is there can be, and I, I call it, um, I call it being prickly. You know, there can kind of be this prickliness about depression is called an atypical or an agitated depression and somebody isn't sad and withdrawn they're really irritable and they're snappy and they're just prickly and they don't what you know they don't come when they're supposed to I don't know why you expect them to show up now you know that's that kind of irritable kind of depression now if somebody's been that way all their lives and they're still that way you can't say it's depression now if someone has always been, you know, some of your words, grumpy, unreasonable, crabby, um, if somebody has always been that way, they're an unhappy person, they're going to be an unhappy person, you know, we, we aren't necessarily going to say they're depressed, but maybe they have been depressed all their lives, 
You know, there are people out there who've never been managed for their depression. So depression doesn't have to be catatonic and so withdrawn that you can't move. It might be not looking forward to things. It might be um, people feeling um, irritable. So that's a bit about depression. So I wanna just talk a little bit more about depression. The couple other things I wanna say about depression is depression is absolutely treatable. So depression can be, <clears throat> and what are some of, so Kathleen, you unmuted. Was there something you wanted to add? I'd love to hear it. Um, yes, just real quick. And, and I apologize for not um, being actually with you guys. I'm, I'm uh, actually just had surgery, so I'm not very presentable at the moment. Um, but anyway, um, uh, just kind of my question would be um, how apathy plays into all of that. Um, Cause it's kind of what you were talking about. Um, you know, I don't want to see my grandkids. I don't want to do this. It's, it's uh, totally my dad, but I know that his therapist and things like that has thrown out the word apathy. Um, so if, and, and I apologize if you're going to get to that a little bit later, but I'm just kind of curious how all that plays in and how you differentiate, you know, does apathy play into depression too, or? Yeah, so that is a great question, Kathleen. Apathy is a symptom. So apathy is that, that loss of interest. So that can be a symptom of depression, absolutely. Apathy can also be a symptom of dementia because the apathy and dementia kind of comes from the chemical and the structural changes whereas the apathy and depression comes from the chemical changes. So apathy means that um, there's a sense of disinterest, a sense of, of um, unconcern or, or a loss of, of um, I guess interest is the best way I can say it. So it can be a symptom of either disease. The difference is sometimes with, um, with dementia, it often is associated with other kinds of frontal lobe problems. So it's associated with things like impulse control problems or, or maybe with um, um, trouble sequencing or, or trouble organizing things or, or trouble kind of, of um, getting started. So initiation kinds of things. And that can be a, true for depression as well, but um, those are kind of a little bit about how apathy, apathy as a symptom plays into depression as a disease or dementia as a disease. Is, is that helpful? You can show me thumbs up or. Yes. Or... Yes. It's helpful. Okay. Um, yeah. It's just my, I noticed that when my father, it's just, you know, he used to be um, always wanted to go places and, and things like that. And now it's just like, no, I just want to stay home. I want the lights turned off. I want the, the blinds closed. Um, okay. So, yeah. So putting together, a, um, putting together those other things of, I just don't want to go out. I want to stay here with the lights off and the blind closed. Um, that makes me really interested and curious about the possibility of depression. Um, Cause those kinds of things of not, um, not being wanting the world to be very still because I can't process versus not having the interest um, that goes along more with dementia. So, and, and the thing is, when we, when we evaluate somebody for depression, it doesn't have to be one or the other. People can have dementia and depression, or people can have, in fact, about 50% of people with dementia, depending on who you read, between 30 to 50% of people with dementia will also have depression. So when I start to look at it that way, it, it's kind of common for the overlap. The, the challenge is, or the, the, the thing to remember is depression responds to treatment really well. So the kinds of treatments like medications for dementia, I mean, for depression, medications for depression, we match up the, the type of depression with the side effects of the medicines. So if someone has a sad, withdrawn kind of depression, we want an antidepressant that tends to be a little more energizing. If somebody's having one of those irritable, distressed depressions, 
we want one of those antidepressants that can kind of create, reduce anxiety, create a symptom more of safety. So kind of managing how we use medications um, is real intentional and real specific. But, but depression isn't only about medications. It's also about things like movement. So getting somebody up and moving around and exercising, getting somebody out in the sunlight, um, because sunlight has real positive impacts on mood disturbances. So getting somebody out in the sunlight, getting them up and moving around, getting a routine in place. People living with dementia respond really well to therapy, especially early on, either individually or in groups. And so going to see a therapist or a counselor can make a big difference in the life of somebody living with dementia. So that those kinds of talk therapy work, talking about your feelings, your experiences uh, can really work as well as getting in groups and doing things can really work for people living with dementia. Now, here's the problem. If you're dealing with somebody who doesn't have any interest in anything and doesn't find joy in anything and doesn't look forward to anything, it's hard to get them to go for a walk. And it's hard to get them to go and talk to the therapist. So often what happens sometimes is we, we need medications to kind of jumpstart it. But then once we can jumpstart, we can get those other pieces in place and then back off of those medications. If we can or if not, we just stay with the medications earlier, you know, before people get to that you know, really apathetic, disinterested, loss of energy. If it's early depression, we notice somebody kind of settling into not looking forward to things. If we start then sometimes exercise and being out in the daylight and doing things that are, are with other people that have times of joy and, um, and, and counseling can, can be really effective as, as the sole thing that people get involved with. So um, any other questions about depression? Anything else that um, anybody would like to ask or, or question or reach out with specifically about depression? So it's, it's um, kind of seeing the difference. Depression kind of, kind of come on slowly. Delirium comes on pretty quickly. Any, Questions or thoughts about depression? Um, you know, we tend to have, with things that happen in the brain, we tend to have this thought that if you would just try harder or pay attention, you could do better. But the reality is managing depression. Um, I would not say to somebody with diabetes, you know, just pull yourself up by your pancreas. You know, I, I wouldn't say that. I would never expect somebody with diabetes to just produce more insulin now, produce more. I, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't expect with anybody with thyroid problems, you know, go thyroid, go, go thyroid. I wouldn't expect that. But with mood disturbances, with anxiety and depression, a lot of times we kind of expect people to just get over it. And, and it's just as wrong to expect somebody with depression to just get over it as it is to expect somebody with diabetes to just get over it. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of loss of self-control. It's, it's not anything like that. It's a sign of your chemicals in your brain aren't where they need to be for you to function optimally. So we need to get them back where they need to be. That might take medication. That might take something else. It might take both. But we need to do something for this person. It's wrong just to leave people there when we've got things that can help. So I'm going to share my screen again. And we're going to talk for just, and since we've got so many things we've talked about about dementia, I'm just going to kind of really quickly um, dementia is a slow change. So it comes on over months and years. And that doesn't mean that somebody's always going to act the same because the structure like this, but these chemicals fluctuate depending on 
what's going on? You know, what's the fit of the expectation? How much competition is there in the environment for me to pay attention to? So um, slow changes, but it can fluctuate. And where in the brain these changes are happening is where I'm going to see different symptoms. So slow changes for dementia and depression, more quick changes for delirium. Delirium, we can fix if we treat. Depression, we can fix if we treat. Dementia, we can make life better with support. So none of these are hopeless. It's just people aren't gonna recover from depression, but people can recover from delirium and uh, people aren't going to recover from dementia, but people can recover from depression and from delirium. So let's start talking about what are the things that we can do. You're noticing some changes. So that first step, that first step is to really watch and to have that low threshold. This is different. I'm going to watch this. I'm not going to label it. This is different. I'm going to notice more of this. And then I want to gather information. I want to really do some measurements if I can do some measurements. Um, I a lot of times encourage people um, to keep um, a, a way they can track it. So I've had some people who've done it with charts. You know, what happens and how bad is it? Or when does it happen? Or where does it happen? So really start to chart. What are you seeing? measures if you know so right how what time the person usually gets up and how many times this week have they gotten up at a different time how much pain medicine does it usually take and how much pain medicine is it taking now really gather that information because when you go to talk to whoever you're going to talk to whether you're going to go and talk with healthcare providers or whether you're going to go and talk with family members you want to be really clear about what you're noticing and how it's different. So if I call, if I call a, a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA, and I say, um, Ms. Jones's blood pressure is 140 over 90. Well, 100 or 150 over 90. That's you know that's not really scary. It's not a big deal unless you know that Mrs. Jones's normal blood pressure is 110 over 70, then it's got some meaning. So when you report what you found, you're going to report what you're seeing now and what's normal for this person. Because that person you're talking with might not realize what, why this is such a worry. Um, so if you say, you know, my mom is sleeping a lot and you don't compare that with what normal sleep is for mom, I don't know how to interpret it. So report what's happening and what, how is it different? And then the, that step four is to plan ahead. And that means to kind of start thinking through some things about how are we with these changes how are we going to make sure this person doesn't get hurt? You know, how are we with these changes going to make sure we keep this person moving? How are we with these changes going to make sure this person gets enough to eat and drink? Because if we don't manage those three things, safety and mobility and hydration and nutrition, whether the person is depressed or whether the person has delirium, we're, we're not helping what's going to happen next. Because whether you're a family member or whether you're on the healthcare team, um, what you know makes a difference. So communicate everything, what you know, what works, what doesn't work, what you're worried about, and, and why you are worried. So I'm gonna stop sharing right now. And we've got, oh gosh, I talked too long. We've only got like three or four minutes left. Um, so, but we've got three or four minutes left. So drop into the chat if you've got something um, you want to add, or if you um, want to unmute and ask a question, 
um, you can do that as well. Or if you want some time to kind of formulate your um, your um, question, um, you want a time to kind of think it through a little bit to kind of say, well, maybe I should ask this or how should I ask this? Um, you can always reach out to Lisa with Dementia Alliance and say, I had this question, what should I, what should I do about this? Or, or what, who do I need to talk to about this? Or what are some resources you have about this? So what kind of questions do you have? Or you can drop them in the chat or unmute and say them out loud. Or did I, I dump too much information in your brain and, and your brain is kind of feeling a little bit of delirium right now. You're feeling a little sensory overload, a little bit too much in there right now. So I don't know if anybody's typing, but I don't see anybody unmuting to ask any questions. So um, for those of you who did ask some questions, I hope I answered them. If I didn't follow up with Lisa. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Lisa with all of my, my thanks and appreciation for inviting me to be here. And thanks to each of you for being willing to be here. Um, I, I say sometimes you can make more money, you can make more friends, but you can't make more time. So the time that you've been here has been precious to me. So thank you for being here. And I'll turn it back over to Lisa. Thank you so much, Melanie. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It was a great amount of information, Melanie. I'm just always impressed with how much you can pack into an hour. Um, so once you, like Melanie said, once you get home or when, later on when you think about all those questions, please feel free to reply back to the invitation email, ask your questions, and we will get that information back out to you. In the meantime, we will send you a copy of this recording so you can review everything and go, that's what I wanted to ask her about. Okay. Um, so if anybody, if just one more chance to ask any questions. No? Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us. I did want to um, just let you know just we have another session with Melanie, April 7th, Wednesday, April 7th. It is a free one hour question and answer on the progression of dementia. And so if you would like to join us, go back to where you registered for this Caring with Melanie series, go to the April 7th Dementia Q&A, and we will be talking about the progression of dementia with Melanie. So thank you all so much for joining us today. And um, thank everyone, you. have a day.